So welcome everyone uh, for the next uh, session again on cornea. So this is a, a dedicated session only for cornea lactatic disorders and we have a very eminent uh, uh, list of speakers who have a huge experience in management of keratoconus and other cornea lactasias. So Dr. Fogla is traveling but he will join us soon. Uh, so let us start uh, the session uh, without any further ado. So I'll be moderating the session and once Dr. Rajesh Fogla, if possible, he would join us. He'll be chairing the session then. So uh, we, uh, we, I'll in, uh, introduce or invite uh, Dr. Rupashri for her first talk on keratoconus or PMD disorders, where to draw the line. So can we have the talk, please? Welcome, Dr. Rupashri. Shashank, you can start the first talk. Good evening, everybody. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, COSCON and Dr. Elan for giving me this opportunity to uh, present here. So my topic for today is keratoconus or pellucid marginal degeneration, where to draw the line. So as we all know, both are non-inflammatory ectatic diseases of the cornea, the hallmark being corneal thinning. The differentiating feature is the area of maximal thinning relative to the location of corneal protrusion. Both of them present with decreased visual acuity because of a distortion of anterior corneal curvature. In both keratoconus and PMD, there is an area of thinning which and there is an area of protrusion. In both in keratoconus, the thinning and the area of protrusion are uh, coinciding with each other. Whereas in PMD, there is an inferior band of about one to two millimeter wide, above which there is a protrusion. It resembles a beer belly configuration. This is a shine flag image showing the same, where both are corresponding in the first picture in keratoconus and in the second picture, you can see that the protrusion is superior to the area of thinning. In keratoconus, flesher rings striae and scarring are common whereas in pmd it is seen sometimes high drops is more common in keratoconus as compared to pmd but in pmd the uh, progression happening well into the mid decades so uh, there is because of the progression there is a probability of high drops happening though seen less commonly so 97% of the ectatic disorders uh, constitute keratoconus, whereas only 3% of the ectatic disorders constitute of uh, pellucid. Both are usually bilateral, but uh, pellucid can present as uh, unilateral and even keratoconus. And pellucid can be there in one eye and um, present as keratoconus in the other eye also. The age at onset is usually pu puberty in keratoconus and it stops progressing in third or fourth decade whereas pellucid presents late in the second and fourth second to fourth decade and usually it uh, keeps progressing throughout lifetime males uh, uh, pmd and kc both are seen more commonly in males whereas uh, but sometimes it can be seen in both uh, males and females so there was this article by uh, Dr. Chaurasia et al, uh, which uh, showed the clinical profile and demographic distribution of pellucid recently published in IJO. Uh, they found out that it commonly affects adult males and predominantly bilateral. And uh, it should be ruled out in patients presenting with against the runa stigmatism. Since the disease progression is slower and usually occurs beyond three years, Frequent follow-up over an extended period needs to be stressed. So as we see in this middle figure, the uh, pellucid presence with against the rule astigmatism, whereas keratoconus is usually inferior steepening. This is a pentacam picture of uh, keratoconus, typically showing an area of uh, steepening inferiorly in the sagittal curvature map which corresponds with the elevation maps where the uh, elevation points are uh, more in uh, the inferior paracentral area, which again corresponds with the thin area on the pachymetry map. In pellucid marginal degeneration, that anterior sagittal curvature usually shows a lobster claw pattern. 
where the uh, there is a horizontal bow tie and the bows of the tie may sometimes uh, meet inferiorly and there is a vertical bow tie which is usually flat and there is one blue lobe contained within the claw and another blue lobe which is above it this picture can be exaggeratedly seen on tangential curvature map an anterior elevation map the same picture uh, seen uh, like a kissing dove pattern on a spherical uh, float sphere but when we put a toric ellipsoid this disappears the hallmark sign uh, the called the bell sign of uh, pmd is seen in the pachymetry map it is very important to open the pachymetry map to a full 12 mm view because this is the only map which will help us differentiate true pellucid from inferior keratoconus or pellucid like keratoconus here you can see that the thinning is inferior and the thinnest point is displaced inferiorly the amount of displacement of the y coordinate of the thinnest point is much more compared to that of keratoconus pellucid can also present without a crab, crab claw appearance on the sagittal curvature map as in this picture but you can see the characteristic bell sign on the pachymetry map pellucid like keratoconus here this picture shows in anterior sagittal curvature map there is a crab claw appearance there is inferior uh, elevation in both anterior and posterior elevation it is raised but on the pachymetry map there is no bell sign and the th thinning is well within the paracentral area it is not inferior like in pellucid this is another pentacam showing the same picture you can see the crab claw but the thinning is central so why is it important to differentiate pellucid from pellucid like keratoconus or even keratoconus because pellucid as stressed previously progression is there well into the mid decades and treatment strategies are different with respect to cross linking intracorneal rings and keratoplasty so management the scleral contact lenses work both uh, well both in keratoconus as well as pmd uh, it reduces the ocular aberrations and also improves visual quality in both kc and pmd coming to cross linking we have to keep certain things in mind when we are doing cross linking for pmd we have to slightly decenter the 9 mm treatment area inferiorly but at the same time there should be an area of untreated zone 1 mm from the limbus this is to avoid limbal still still stem cell damage following cxl treatment cxl has been combined with prk and also with uh, corneal stromal rings we we can see in this topography that cxl has worked well causing flattening of the inferior cornea post cxl treatment this is a 8 month uh, follow up picture when coming to intracorneal ring segments intracorneal ring segments like intax uh, cara rings and myo rings have been used in uh, pmd the largest uh, series what i found was of 15 patients where they have used the myo ring and they consider it to be a very uh, effective and safe uh, and reversible treatment modality for pmd there are concerns when putting intax or intracorneal ring segments in the inferior cornea because that area is where there is maximum thinning and so it should not lead to some amount of uh, perforation or other complications uh, while inserting the ring also when we add uh, rings we can also uh, add tissue in the sense that there are articles showing femtosecond laser assisted peripheral additive stromal keratoplasty for treatment of uh, uh, pmd where they have made a, a stromal pocket and inserted a stromal uh, corneal stroma and a pocket can be made either using a mechanical uh, method or using a femtosecond laser 
also there uh, they uh, you can also make a scleral pocket and uh, enter from the scleral side and thereby insert a, a graft through that pocket also so we all know that once the uh, cone is stabilized whether in keratoconus or pmd using uh, cross linking then we can uh, opt for any method of correction of astigmatism be it scleral contact lenses or be it toric icl or iol uh, here you can see that there uh, the there are many reports of uh, showing uh, the benefits of toric icl in keratoconus but very few reports of uh, toric icl uh, working well in pmd cases this is post intax in the second picture you can see post uh, intax uh, they have uh, placed a toric icl wedge resection is one more method where uh, uh, you can resect a wedge from the inferior cornea and suture the rest this could be lamellar or full thickness this is supposed to decrease the astigmatism uh, caused by pmd coming to keratoplasty either it could be a full thickness uh, keratoplasty or deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty the uh, graft will definitely be a large graft because it has to cover till the periphery and also it could be inferiorly decentered these cases are slightly riskier in uh, pmd because the graft is up till the periphery so there is more chance of vascularization rejection and uh, and suture related complications so in conclusion, I would say that PMD is a variant of KC or a unique disease entity is still open for argument. PMD corneas are typically low prolate to oblate in shape, while keratoconus corneas are almost always markedly prolate in shape. So anybody with astigmatism, especially against the rule, we have to get a pentacam done to rule out PMD. Also, we will be doing a slit lamp examination, but most important is a pachymetric map which plays an important role in differentiating pmd from kc it is important to differentiate these two entities because management strategies are different thank you thank you dr rupashi that was an excellent uh, summary of both the variants so we'll just take one question before we move ahead move ahead dr rupashi uh, now you very well showed us the crab claw appearance which earlier was thought was a classical of pellucid but now we know there is something called keratoconus like uh, 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 yeah. So any other tips you would want to give for a person or a doctor who's using a placido based disc and any other tips you can tell us if they don't have access to pachymetry or you say a pentacam would be a must to differentiate between uh, both the modalities. If you can uh, just uh, see, uh, do a pachymetry in the thin area, then also it would be beneficial. And also against the rule astigmatism, if you uh, catch uh, and do all uh, against the rule astigmatism, a careful slit lamp examination itself would suffice. But then if you want to catch them in early stages, I would say pentacam is the best modality. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. You. Uh, so welcome, uh, Dr. Rajesh Fogla, sir. I know you're traveling, but uh, thank you so much for joining in. Hi. <laughs> So we see Colombo in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So uh, we just had our first talk, sir. Dr. Rupashi, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you joined uh, a little I late. Think, I think she has covered it very well. And in fact, uh, there is no single modality of treatment for pellucid. It all depends on the clinical presentation. I have had cases where the patient had against the rule astigmatism, but with refractive correction, like even with glasses, they were able to read six, nine or better. And a lot of them, uh, despite the inferior thinning, we advised them cross-linking to try and arrest the progression. And uh, just a simple cataract surgery with a toric IOL can also help the patient see better. Uh, the other modalities of treatment, invasive treatment are only when the you know irregular astigmatism is present or the vision cannot be corrected and the patient is not willing to wear as scleral contact lenses, then we can think about. All these stromal augmentation, crescentic patch graft, these are good stromal additive procedures, 
but the refractive correction takes time because whenever you add sutures or any kind of materials, the patient should be willing to wait for the final vision correction. Large diameter lamellar keratoplasty works well, but then you need an experienced surgeon who is not likely to convert to a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty when you are doing a large graft. And as you rightly point out that the distinction between keratoconus and pellucid is sometimes a little difficult. Sometimes you may see a younger patient with a crab claw like appearance on topography and, you know, then you're confused, you know, because, you know, pellucid is seen in the elder, elderly population and here you have a 25 or 28 year old with a crab claw appearance. So I, I think that's just not the one criteria with which you can diagnose. That inferior thinning, what you can see on a tomography is essential to make the diagnosis. True. Just one last question, Dr. Fogler. I, we are always uh, happy when a KC patient comes and uh, for a cataract surgery, we know it's stable. So many times we do a toric lens and things like that. But in PMD, we are always scared what if he worsens further. So we have seen progression of PMD at 50, 55 also. So what is your take on that and uh, what is your protocol when you want to plan a toric lens of 50-55 uh, year plus? Probably 2-3 years is stable, so do you take it for granted it may not or what is your protocol in elderly with PMD and toric lenses? I think we lost. Uh, uh, if you can read the page, has been, then you can do another eyes crossing thing. Yeah. I think we lost you, sir. We yeah. can hear I, you back now. Yeah, I think. Uh, sure. Okay. Fine. So I request all the speakers to stay back. Uh, we can tape questions as and when. So next I'll be speaking about uh, visual rehabilitation in keratoconus. Basically a comprehensive uh, go through of all the modalities. Uh, I'll be just briefing uh, which our speakers also will tell in detail. So Shasha, can we have the next presentation? Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, uh, actually uh, I have put for the download actually. Can you please mm -hmm. play it? Uh, do you have it? Yes. I do have okay. a very good evening on your trans, on your trans spectacle contact lenses uh, CXL along with uh, various other procedures and then corneal transplants now uh, spectacles and contact lens are the most commonest modalities that everyone would use clinically but they're always least spoken of so uh, uh, I thought I'll uh, emphasize a little bit on these before proceeding so spectacles all said and done whatever modalities are there majority of our patient do manage their uh, lives with glasses and contact lenses so it's very extremely important that you give them a good pair of uh, glasses so if you ask any optometrist the toughest case they would find for refract is a case of keratoconus because of the scissoring reflex they are unable to uh, neutralize uh, the axis as well as the power so it's uh, a very uh, tough uh, challenge to give them a good pair of glasses. So a good understanding of the corneal topography, uh, trying your best to neutralize in spite of the scissoring and also end of it a subjective acceptance is extremely important. So in our practice a subjective acceptance is taken more value than an objective in case of keratoconus as what you see on the scans is actually not what your patient accepts because of a lot of higher order operations and a wavefront assisted refraction like in an IDEC OPD3 scan can be of uh, great value here. So always uh, go by the subjective uh, no matter what axis your ARK or your topography gives. Again when you choose a frame it's very important uh, especially as these patients have a high cylinder make sure you're choosing a sturdy frame and this four point touch is something we need to teach all our patients to keep checking once in few weeks or few months to check for the alignment and all said and done please educate your patient that your refraction is always going to be different every place he visits is going to be different that doesn't mean it's changed it's just that his cornea is so irregular that no one can give him a perfect pair of glasses now again contact lens i think is the best modality for treating keratoconus 
No matter how good a surgeon you are, it's impossible to give that crispness and clarity uh, what a contact lens would give. So there are a lot of uh, options and a lot of advances in the contact lens uh, technology today. Now I'll uh, briefly take you uh, through few of them. So you can grade keratoconus by a lot of gradings, but when you're coming to the contact lens fitting, these gradings don't uh, stand good. Basically, your for your contact lens, you need to divide your cone into a nipple cone. That would be a central bank central cone or an oval cone, which is a little larger cone or a globus sort of cornea where the entire cornea is sort of ecstatic. And based on this, you can choose if you want a small di RGP, a multi curve large di RGP, cornea scleral, or a scleral lens. And again, on based on the K reading, you can uh, try to choose the lens that uh, you would want to. Now, again, uh, how do you know what cone? Uh, there are a lot of options. If you look at the pentacam, it's always nice to have a tangential. Like this is uh, left side is patient one, right side is patient two on sagittal. But as soon as you convert the maps into tangential, you see that the cones are more obvious. So always look at the tangential curvatures when you're trying to know what are the type of cone before you start your first uh, contact lens. Now a word about soft lenses. Now soft lenses do have a role. Uh, today there are huge advances in soft lenses as well. So for example, this is a patient who's had a post uh, transplant and he has a huge astigmatism of eight adapters. And right side is uh, after putting a customized soft contact lens on him and taking a topography. So there uh, is a role of uh, soft contact lens as well. And especially when you have a central cone with a symmetric uh, sort of an appearance. Now going to the fitting of a, a semi soft contact lens, all you need is a trial lens. You need fluorescent strips and a slit lamp. So it's very important you do a right kind of application. Never touch the ocular surface uh, with your fluorescent. Always put a drop of saline or lubricating drop and do it in a hanging drop technique. So what you want in a good contact lens is a minimal corneal trauma as the patient wears it for several hours and uh, excellent quality of vision and a day long comfort. So how do you get it? So this is an ideal contact lens fitting. You need a central feather touch. You need a paracentral clearance. You need a pet peripheral bearing. And then you have a peripheral lift up or clearance, which is called as a three point touch. So these can be at, uh, attained by three different parameters. One is the diameter, the base curve and uh, the edge lift of your RGP lens. Now, uh, the diameter of the RGP lens must be around uh, 2 mm smaller than the uh, limbus. And the base curve, again, all of us know how do you get uh, what is a flat lens or a steep lens. So these are few clinical signs to tell if your lens is steep and flat. And by doing these modifications, you can uh, steepen a flatter lens or flatten a steeper lens until your ideal fit is achieved. So again, it is a process of learning and trial of few lenses where you could perfect this uh, with no time at all. And the last thing you would see is after finalizing the central fit, you need to go and look at your edge lift. Now again, edge lift has to be around 0.2 to 0.3 and ideally uniform. So depending on how tight or loose, we can increase or decrease the edge lift. Now, not all companies allow us the liberty of changing the edge lift, but today a lot of customizable uh, lenses or manufacturers, both Indian and imported, where you can keep the same center fit and just modify the peripheral fit. So I'll just take you uh, through a few cases. This, so this is a central uh, cone. So this was the first trial lens uh, which was applied. And um, when you look at the central fit, it is decent. There is a feather touch, but the edge lift is extremely less. So you go ahead and ask the company to uh, increase the edge lift. So uh, after increasing the edge lift, you see that the 0.2 and 0.3 mm of fluorescent uh, is there. And a good edge lift is extremely important for good tear exchange. So never compromise on the edge lift. So this is the next case. Again, uh, the central fit is decent, but the edge lift is extremely less. So I go two steps above and I feel the edge lift is too much. And again, I get one step below and this is an ideal edge lift fit. So there are a lot of options. So this is of the Roske platform where uh, you have a lot of options on increasing or decreasing your edge lift. 
now this is again an inferior cone so this was my trial lens the superior part i'm happy but the inferior uh, edge lift off i'm not very happy because this keeps uh, you no know, poking on the patient's lower lid and he may not be comfortable so you can tuck in the inferior part by something called as an asymmetric uh, corneal uh, technology or act where the company can tuck in only the inferior part again a very good option for uh, inferior cones now this is a patient who has sort of a saddle pattern topography so as you see the red arrows is where the edge lift is more and the blue arrows is where the edge lift is less so this is the final fit after a modification called a storic periphery so say how beautifully the edge lift has uh, settled down so this again is available on the rose care platform where you can give a toric periphery uh, option so with this any sort of cone you have however steep or however flat many a times you should be able to fit in just with a simple uh, 8 to 10 mm of rgp lens and you can give a good fit now the next set of patients are those who are very irregular could be with patients who have had intacts or clair or patients who have had a corneal transplant and yet uh, have irregular astigmatism or just about a very steep cornea or a globus sort of cornea so these patients do very do, do very well with corneal sclerals mini sclerals and full scleral lenses again in the interest of time i may not be able to go through but again you have this optic zone transitional zone and a landing zone and uh, these are the various uh, indications where you can uh, this is an ideal fit of a scleral contact lenses so uh, you can run through how a steep fit is how a flat fit is and it's not very tough to attain a good fit once you have done a, a number of trials again with today's technology oct gives us an excellent uh, modality for judging our uh, scleral fit especially when you're looking at the haptic or if you're looking at the central clearance so uh, next modality would be the surgical modalities i won't be covering uh, the excimer icl and intacts that will be covered but a little a few words on the lens secure insertions and the cares which are uh, uh, excellent in your approaches of managing keratoconus so here we see uh, dr rajesh fogla demonstrating uh, the creation of the lenticule using a femtosecond laser and then the same is inserted in a lamella dissected keratoconic cornea so it's an excellent modality to add tissue make it uh, thicker and also to modify the curvature of the keratoconic cornea and again uh, the corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments which were introduced to the world by dr susan jacob again seems a promising modality and she has described various ways in which these segments uh, can be inserted and suggests they are good alternatives to the uh, artificial intact ring so yes there are a lot of advances in the field of keratoconus that's happening now uh, a small question to all of you so this is the pre operative photo and this is the post operative photo so any guesses what surgery was done uh, it was just a straight corneal collagen cross linking yes we do see this excessive flattening and progressive flattening post cross linking which actually uh, adds a huge refractive element and majority many of these patients improve a lot just by a cross linking so these are the uh, this was the huge difference seen just after a uh, conventional cross linking so flattening of almost 12 uh, diopters so these are the normal changes that we see post cross linking in the topography but in our series we have a significant number of them uh, which showed a huge flattening this is one other patient where there's not much flattening in 2 months but again after 2 years and again uh, had a close to 10 diopters of flattening again the next patient so much smoothing it almost looks like a topo guided treatment but no this was just a cross linking so the uh, in our series majority of these patients were uh, post conventional cross linking and these were not related to the scar they were true flattening and truly have given a huge refractive uh, advantage to the patients so i just thought i'll put it in and last when nothing works or when your patient is not keen on wearing contact lenses then there are a lot of advancements in the transplantation uh, field so uh, dalk has been most popular and today with the advancement of anterior lamellar keratoplasty 
there are very few indications for a th full thickness uh, corneal transplant. So I won't get into uh, corneal transplantation much as we have the guru himself, Dr. Fogla, who would uh, talk about this in detail. So I'll end it with this case presentation. A 24-year-old male with progressive blurring from a year, a known case of keratoconus and a 6-month-old scan done elsewhere showed a rapid progression. Now, when you look at these corneas, it's a Senbank central cone and an extremely steep cornea. So you have the central cone, central uh, uh, K-max is almost around 86 and an extremely thin cornea, which is 362. Now, as soon as you look at this sort of a topography, which is progressing, we have various thoughts. How do you cross-link a cornea, which is uh, so thin, 362? And even if I cross-link, would I be able to manage him or visually rehabilitate him? with his steep K being 82 and would it be a straightforward indication for corneal transplant. So let us see what we did. So this was the cornea highly scarred. So we did something uh, called the contact lens assisted CXL where the contact lens augments the corneal thickness and thereby saves your endothelium during the cross-linking. After four to six weeks, we do an RGP trial. This was the trial lens. The center fit was good, peripherally was not geared, so we customized and uh, gave him a good peripheral fit and within four to six weeks he is 6 6 and n6 uh, just with a simple procedure of cross-linking and contact lenses so this sums to say that there are too many uh, advances very exciting advances in the field of keratoconus today way too many options so it is up to us how we want to customize based on a patient's need his affordability and all the modalities uh, that are available and i would also want to end it saying contact lenses are a huge modality and uh, it should not be left uh, into the sole discretion of our optometry colleagues alone uh, thank you so much So, thank you. Uh, Fogla, sir, any comments on clinical management before we proceed to the next talk? No, Deepti, I think you have covered it very well. And your last final concluding statement that contact lens still form the mainstay of management of ectatic corneal disorders, I completely agree. And I think uh, huge advancements have been made in the way contact lenses are fitted. And just a traditional RGP contact lens, you should not try that and give it up and say it doesn't fit. Because like you said, that by modifying the edge lift and doing the asymmetric, uh, you know, edge lift uh, in a contact lens or a toric lens, it, it, that kind of, you know, so, so it, it's a time consuming process. Sometimes the fitting of that also takes up considerable share time. So in case uh, if, if, if a practicing ophthalmologist is not familiar with these, I think they should always reach out to an optometrist or somebody else who fits these lenses before the patient is given the option of a surgical intervention. True. Very true, sir. The time required is certainly more than the dark surgery. And probably yeah, you would absolutely. be able to do and, three and, dark and, surgeries and, in that time. It's not, it's not just the fitting of the lens that you do at that point of time. Mm -hmm. Often true. we find that the patients take the lenses when they start wearing the lenses. It still requires some refinement because just that one sitting of fitting a lens is not something that, you know, that's the final one. So, but if you can fit a contact lens, the patient is the most satisfied because it gives the best refraction. True. Thank you, sir. So may I now require, uh, request uh, Dr. Raghu Nagaraju for his uh, presentation on topo guided PRK, does it really work? So Dr. Raghu. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think I have shared the video. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'll play. I'll play it right away. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Raghu, cornea and refractive surgeon, Apollo Hospital, Shishadipuram. I would like to thank KOS members for giving me an opportunity to talk on topography guided PRK. Does it really work? So let's start with our presentation. So this topo-guided ablation, does it really work? It's a big question being asked, asked, and it has been answered to some extent. So why we need a topo-guided PRK or a topo-guided ablation? The 
most of the refractive surfaces are, is on the cornea and most of the abrasions are in the cornea. The resolution of the topography scan is much greater than what we get with the reference guided reading. Topography can give up to 20,000 points of information about the corneal surface as compared to 100 to 200 points what you get with different reading. So what is this propagated ability? It is a type of, type of ablation where it differs from other type of ablations like wavefront guided or wavefront optimized ablation where it takes corneal irregularities into account with the aim of providing the cornea with a more optical ideal shape. It gives an excellent efficacy and safety for the patient with irregular cornea. The main goal of topogadent PRK or an ablation is to regularize cornea with flattening the steep area and steepening flat area. So it's a customized examined treatment guided by a topographic map. This topographic map is acquired by a multiple sequential map through a topography machine, followed by which a sophisticated algorithm is designed for laser ablation based on the optical zone, the depth of ablation, and also you can add on to the sphere, cylinder, and the axis which you are planning for. So there are various platforms which are available. One, of, one such platform is topographic PRK with a Bell 90 platform where you use Atlas topography machine, which captures the topography images and then it is transferred to the planning section called as station called as CRS platform, where it is designed, ablation depth is designed, the spiro cylinder is centered, and then you get a AAA design called as advanced ablation algorithm planning. Once you do that, then you can use Mel 90 machine for propagated ablation. You see, electric wavelet platform, it uses or an oculizer when you capture a topographic image and transfer it to a computer. And then you directly, the data is transferred to the wavelet machine where the topographic ablations are done. Contour vision by a favorite EA 500 users equalizer to capture the topographic images. And then the data is stored, and then the ablation pattern is designed after entering the manifest refraction. And then the data is entered into the XML user. And then you get a topographic ablation, which you can do. So, refractive correction primarily for the patient who is myopic with an astigmatism, does it really work? Topographic PRK works very well. If you see a contour vision by Alcon, the, if you compare the contour vision topographic ablation versus wavefront optimized ablation, it has an equal result regarding efficacy and accuracy. Tissue ablated with topographic ablation or topographic PRK versus wavefront optimized ablation the tissue ablated is less with topoguided ablation. Topoguided ablation has less effect on the corneal shape and amount of higher order abrasions induced by refractive correction is less with topoguided ablation. The only limitation is the axis discrepancy between the manifest refraction and the topoguided astigmatism. If it is more than 20 degrees, Topographic ability less effective. Topographic ablation in Mel 90, especially topographic PRK, has an excellent result with better contrast and low induction of higher order ablation. Tissue ablation is less with topographic ablation when you compare with wavefront guided or wavefront optim optimized ablation. The only limitation is if the astigmatism is not a corneal origin, then you should not plan for topographic. PRK. The tissue ablation in topoguided PRK versus topo wavefront optimized ablation, you can see the amount of tissue ablated is 
almost 20% less compared to peripheral optimized ability. So, where else this propagandant therapy really works? It help. It is basically planned and designed to take care of more complicated abrasion due to corneal scar, irregular astigmatism, previous corneal refractive surgery with an decentered ablation on a small optical zone or an island, and also for post corneal transplant irregularities. And most commonly in present days, propagated PRK has shown an excellent result in keratoconus. And usually, simultaneous cross linking is what has been addressed by many authors. So, let us come to what really propagated PRK is effective for all extractive disorders. Propagated PRK in combination with cross linking appears to offer a best chance to reduce irregular astigmatism. It is suitable for early or mild keratoconus, which has a pachymetry of more than 460 to 470 microns. The corneal epithelium is removed using 50 microns of PTK, or you can remove the epithelium using alcohol. And then optical zone should be 6.5 mm with a transition zone of 8.3 mm. Stromal laser ablation is typically limited for 50 microns. It is not for full correction when you are treating for keratoconus or any ectatic disorder. The main aim is to regularize the cornea rather than correcting the total refractive error which is there in the patient. The cross-linking procedure is performed according to Athens protocol. Bandage contact lens is applied like all PRK procedures for, and it is removed on third, fourth or fifth post of day. Steroid usage is advisable for a longer duration when you do propagated PRK for ectatic disorders so that the patient doesn't get cordial scars. And also MMC usage, few people do use MMC even when they do ablation for ectatic disorder. Some says no, we don't use, but as of, you, uh, as of now, using MMC will reduce the amount of scar which is induced. So, correlated PRK with cross-linking in keratoconus, it is, it is uh, used for, in, if it is inferior steepening, the myopic treatment is performed on the cone. If you see here, this is the inferior steepening or a decentered cone. A ablation pattern post op post operatively, you can see there is a myotic, myopic treatment which has happened in the inferior cone, and a hyperopic treatment has happened in the superior area of the cone. The patient who benefit most during this topoguided PRK in keratoconus is when the diaptic difference across their cornea is 10 diopters or less. Apart from this, after LASIK PRK, the complicated dies with stable cornea after LASIK when there is a nasty medicine or a decentered ablation, central island, small optical zone, or an irregular astic medicine is there. Then topographic PRK helps in enlarging the optical zone, reducing the irregular astic medicine, at astic medicine and improve both BCVA and quality of vision. Also, in increasing the contractility of the patient. So, to conclude, topo guided PRK is effective and accurate when it is done on a selected cases. Topo guided PRK can be used as a standard platform for primary treatment of refractive corrections when the astigmatic astigmatism discrepancy is not more than 20 degrees. Topoguided PRK treatment combined with cross-linking is effective in ectatic disorders. Topoguided PRK is one of the treatment options of complication after LASIK or PRK or post-RKIs. While treating virgin eyes, topoguided PRK is effective if the axis of the manifest refraction and the topography measured astigmatism is more than is not more than 20 degrees. In topographic PRK, amount of tissue ablated when it is compared with wavefront optimized or wavefront guided ablation is much lesser on an average around 
10 to 20 percent of the tissue can be saved in topo guided ablation when you compare with wavefront optimized or wavefront guided ablation. Thank you for giving an opportunity. We can open the discussion and we can have a nice discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Raghu. That was an excellent uh, overview. Uh, but I think there are so many variations, so many possibilities when it comes to topo guided treatment. There can never be uh, no single way of doing it. So I think that's a whole day of discussion as to how each one of us would plan our treatments. So uh, we'll keep a few questions if time allows after a while. And now can I invite uh, Dr. Nandini C. from Narayan Netralaya for her talk on intracorneal ring segments patient selections and outcomes. Shesha, can we have the talk? Uh, good evening, everyone. I wholeheartedly thank Dr. Ellen Kumar for giving me an opportunity to speak on this forum. Uh, my talk for today is intracorneal ring segments. I have no uh, financial disclosure. Intracorneal ring segments, as we all know that they are one of the modality of treatment in keratoconus. They consist of two 150 degree arcs of PMMA segments. The traditional intax ring has the optical zone of seven millimeter. Then came the intax SK ring. The SK stands either for severe keratoconus or the steep cornea. These are oval in cross section and they have an optical zone of around six millimeter. As it lies closer to the visual axis, it has a greater flattening effect on the central cornea. So how does this work? When we insert this intax inside the cornea, it increases the bulk of the cornea. Thus, it would cause stretching of the central cornea, cause, causing relative flattening. So my aim of intax insertion is to improve the quality of vision in my patient by changing the position of the cone, thus altering the shape of the cornea and reducing the steepness of the cornea. So who are the ideal candidates for this procedure? Those patients with mild to moderate keratoconus, post LASIK ectasia, with K values ranging in between 45 to 65 diopter, and the pachymetry at the incision site in around the seven millimeter zone should be a minimum of 400 microns, and those patients who have good potential for vision without any scars in the visual axis. So how do I plan this index in my patient? Before I plan, I need to have the measurement of refraction and the corneal topography. So in keratoconus, the subjective acceptance or the refraction will have high variability. And that's the reason when we measure the refraction, we get different readings at different times. If patient has poorer vision, say less than six by 12, then the refraction may not be reliable and it should be questioned. In corneal topography, we need curvature map, we need the posterior float map and the pachymetric map for planning. Next step is you have to identify where your cone is located, whether it is a center or a decentered cone. If 50% of your cone comes within the central 3mm zone, we call it as a centered cone. If more than 50% of the cone is beyond the central 3mm zone, then we call it as a decentered cone. If the cone is too much decentered, you may have high chances of perforation. So you will have because you will have less uh, pachymetry in that particular zone. So better not to plan um, intact ring in too much decentered cones. Next step is to identify the incision axis. This is done by integer method and to identify the flat and steep meridian of the cone, and then verifying this with the uh, other two things like uh, the axis of the steep uh, meridian, steep uh, uh, K value in the topography and the plus cylindrical form in the subjective acceptance. So let's understand this by looking at an example. So in intuitive method, you can identify by looking at the picture where, where is your cone located? And then you can decide where you would want to push the cone from. It is very simple. So intuitively, it would tell you that 
my ring uh, has to push the cone from this particular direction. So you may not get the exact point, uh, but you will have an idea that it should be in this direction. So if you look at this case, once we know that by intuitively we have to push the cone from inferiorly, then you are going to draw a, per, uh, a line from the uh, posterior elevation on posterior elevation map from the center of the cone to the center or the vertex of the cornea. This denotes your flat meridian, which is uh, the displacement of the cone. Then you draw a line which is perpendicular to it at the center, which shows your steep meridian. So this will be the axis at which you have to take your incision. So here, by this method, it is nearly around 10 to 15 degree. So to verify, you converted the subjective acceptance to plus cylindrical form which would come to around 10 degree again here and on the steep k axis usually it is around 7 degree so all the three methods are correlating so incision at 10 degree is good enough in this case next you have to decide the size of ring what you want to put depending whether it is a traditional intact ring or the sk ring we have the nomograms let's look at the sk ring which we have more commonly used and uh, for a symmetric and the asymmetric ring, the calculation would uh, differ slightly. So with our experience, the rings what we chose invariably underperforms. So we have to always choose a, a ring size, which is a little higher. Next is you should know at what depth you're going to insert your intact ring. So if you look, so we are going to place the index ring in seven millimeter zone. So you need to look at uh, the thinness pack in the seven millimeter zone here, it would be around 540. So the 70% of this would be the depth at which you are going to insert the ring. In this case, it would be around like 370 microns. So I still have around 140 to 150 microns below the index. So that the chance of perforation of my ring would be very less. So to make our job easy, Pentagram HR of Oculus does have a nice program which tells you at what depth you have to insert this ring at different different zones depending on the ring what you want to insert. Next, coming to when you want to plan the symmetric rings. Symmetric rings can be planned when you have a symmetrical cone. Like in this case, you have a, a centered cone where we have planned a symmetric ring and you can see that post-operatively, there is a reduction in K-values with improvement in the best character visual activity. Another case where there is a central cone, so tentatively, here the myopic error is uh, around minus eight. So according to nomogram for minus eight error, you can choose either 0.4 or 0.45 ring. But with, as I mentioned earlier, the intact ring invariably underperforms. So it's better to choose one ring size higher. So we chose 0.45 uh, ring here, symmetric rings here. And post-operatively, you could see that the spherical error is reduced significantly and we, could, we did get a good outcome. So when are you going to plan an asymmetric rings? Asymmetric uh, rings can be planned when you have an asymmetric cone. So in, in decented cone, you have the cone from where you want to push from. That is here, it is towards, uh, it is from the inferior side. So the bigger size ring usually will be placed on the on that particular direction where you would want to push the cone from. And it is the size ring, uh, the size of this ring would be based on the cylindrical power, what how much you want to correct. The other smaller ring size that should be inserted in the other direction to balance the bigger ring. And most of the time, the size of this smaller ring would be 0.21. So, this is another case where we have planned an asymmetric ring and post-operatively we did had a good outcome. And next coming to the single ring, when you are going to put the single ring. So typical example would be a post-lasic ectasia. Here, a superior area where uh, you have relatively flat area. So if you put, if you need not put two rings because already there is a flat area, you don't want to make this area even more flat. So if you put a single ring here, that is good enough to achieve a good outcome. 
another example of post lasik ectasia she was a dental doctor who had a lasik couple of years back when she presented to us she had a significant post lasik ectasia a single sk.45 ring was planted and uh, this was a picture of a woman post operatively and you can notice that uh, the curvature is almost regular and on long term at the end of one and a half uh, years her uncorrected vision acuity was almost 66 parts the beauty of this uh, case was so when you put uh, intact ring in a post lasik ectasia it is almost similar to a post lasik picture uh, what gives a regular cornea so uh, putting a uh, intact uh, putting a intact ring in a post lasik ectasia always gives a good outcome in our personal experience we have studied uh, in more than around like 50 patients that we had a comparative group where half of them were uh, underwent only cross linking in post lasik ectasia and other half underwent post uh, cross linking along with intact ring and those who had underwent along with intact ring had a good visual outcome compared to the non intact screen patients so in post lasik ectasia you have to push the patient to undergo cross linking along with intact to achieve a good visual outcomes so looking at the literature review most of the studies have large variation in terms of duration in terms of the visual outcomes this is the uh, largest group which has studied the intact ring and it has studied all the grades of keratoconus and has proved that uh, the intact doesn't have any role in severe keratoconus except for mild to moderate where it also uh, improves the uh, uncorrected visual acuity which was shown uh, where the similar result was shown in this study as well and kaiminos uh, et al have shown that uh, the long term safety of the intact uh, it was around 5 years and shetty et al have proved that the intact is 100% safe in his study and coming to one more study where uh, it was uh, a study in post lasik ectasia patient where they compare uh, double ring uh, double ring versus single ring implantation and the single ring did have it was equally safe and efficacious as uh, the double ring insertion the single ring implantation is good enough in post lasik ectasia patients so with this i would like to conclude that uh, intact ring implantation is a safe and effective uh, modality to treat uh, mild to moderate keratoconus and post lasik ectasia patients proper case selection and planning is uh, necessary to achieve a uh, effective uh, outcome even in long term thank you thank you so much dr nandini that was such a meticulously step by step guide i think it was excellent thank you so much and i think your last slide said it on I, all your beautiful results i'm sure are after you know the perfect case selection and planning otherwise it's just impossible to get the results you have so thank you so much nandini for that uh, wonderful guide so i would now invite uh, dr priyank solanki uh, for his talk on uh, toric icls in uh, ectasias Welcome, Dr. Priyank. Thank you, Dr. Gupti. Um, at the outset, I would thank uh, the team of Karnataka Ophthalmic Society uh, uh, to give me, for giving me this chance to have a insight on uh, fakic IELTS in keratoconus. As we all know, it's been a, a norm talk about all the clinical, but just still a small uh, update on that. It's a corneal ectasia with an irregularly irregular cornea. there are going to be a lot of spherical and chromatic aberrations uh, along with that and a surgical treatment for a progressive cases so the visual uh, re rehabilitation has already been discussed uh, regarding the collagen cross linking glasses and rgp and specialty contact lenses corneal ring segments also and at last comes the fakic curls i will be talking only about the fakic curls in this talk now uh, fakic curls are the preferred modality of treatment in stable refractive errors uh, where uh, it's been stable for more than one year they are safer and more predictable than other ones it is a 100% reversible option it's been as a proven efficacy customization options are also available with what uh, with a very high uh, level of cylindrical correction also it is one of the best option for an ffkc or stable or post c3r corneas and they are very very less likely to contribute to dry eyes so uh, uh, what would be the work up for a case for a keratoconus or a, a ffkc or an advanced keratoconus the age should be about 18 to 20 and above uh, 
keep as 21 because most of them can you know, progress even after that, but then there should be a stable refraction for more than at least a year. I keep it a minimum nine months. Some surgeons also keep it six months, but nine months to one year should be good enough. A central anterior chamber depth should be more than three mm is what the studies say, but most of us practically follow as 2.8 millimeters. Peripheral anterior chamber depth is also very important. I'll be showing in the next further slides why I'm saying this. Gonoscopy to see the angle structures, uh, to see if, in case of a plateau iris configuration, the crystalline lens status and the ocular information if he or she is prone for any other uh, informations. Pre any previous ocular surgeries regarding like a retinal problem or retinal detachment, try to avoid uh, such cases because this can cause a problem in future. A serial topographic evaluation to see the stability of the topography, to see the K reading and the corneal status, to see where if the cone is moving or it's, uh, it's periphery progressing. The white to white status has to be checked manually and also been to be verified with the topography. Always do a manual verification with uh, calipers, be it digital or manual, but always it has to be done and it has to be done at the horizontal level from mid limbus to mid limbus. Pupil size, yes, it is important, but in an Indian scenario, I think the general pupil size is about five, maximum six. So most of these lenses do not go beyond that. So that should be still fine, but still a note on that has to be taken. Ocular surface, uh, I'm talking this because most of, a few of these cases would also have uh, one character conjunctivitis, and we need to see the corneal structure also in this. A family history of retinal detachment is also important. So uh, why I'm saying uh, that this one thing which we need to do is something called as a fake or pseudo depth. Now here we have to be very careful because um, let's say when you see this case in which you have a central ACD here, but when you see in the central uh, character corners, if it's a central cone more so, the ACD is quite deep. So which was actually somewhere this, there is a increased depth. So in the image in the right side, you can see out an ASOCT picture where it's been taken from the anterior surface. Generally, ACD is taken from the endothelium to the anterior uh, lenticular surface or capsule. But then here, for a reference, you have taken that. So you see that here, it is starting from here and going here and the value is about 3.49. The same if you do a bit, you know, uh, in the keratoconic maximum uh, protrusion area, it goes about to 3.75. So where it is being measured also makes a difference. So you have to check this personally with your uh, instrument uh, on the topography machine and ASOCT to see where the actual uh, depth is. And you're going to take a central depth, not a paracentral depth. Uh, this is one example which I would show, which was done in our center. So here you can see that in the right eye, the central ACD is about 3.56. The same thing uh, in the left eye, you see that the ACD is about 3.94. There's a big difference is about 0.4 millimeters and that's a huge because if you're planning for a case uh, for a fake iod for this, a toric fake iod, you're gonna land in trouble if you're gonna say, send this uh, without verifying properly because the um, the white to white or the lens uh, size will change and that could lead to a peripheral and uh, the iris being uh, pushed up. That could cause an angle block. Similarly here, you can see one of the cases where it is a mild case, but then this case had quite a severe uh, peripheral scarring also, where you can see here in the left eye, if you see it is 3.404. So looking at this, yes, it is still under the you know, radar that we can perform a fake eye. But when you see the right eye of the same case, it's about 2.67 only. Now that shows there's a huge change. So either is there is a pseudo change, a pseudo high, or pseudo less, or there is a wrong measurement which has been taken by the machine. So you always have to check along with sit lamp, your ASOCT and your topographic evaluation also. And I would uh, you know, avoid such cases Otherwise, you might land up in problems in future. So um, in the market, there are four basic types which have been available in our subcontinent. The most uh, famous one is the STAR, which is the ICL. 
The other one is a biotech, which uh, comes at brand name of Icryl uh, Fikik oil from Care, IPCL, and from Upper Sami RL. I personally have experience in all the first three star biotech and care group. I don't have any experience from Upper Sami, but um, from what I've heard from my colleagues, it does well, but I'm not sure about the stability or post keratoconic uh, or post C3 R cases. I'm not sure about those. The other three uh, star biotech and care group I've used and almost all, uh, all the lenses of them, uh, all the companies uh, do well and there is a good stability in them also with the good outcomes. Few of, uh, I would share one, two small case scenarios here. Uh, uh, a 30 year old male with both eyes keratoconus who was uh, operated for collagen cross thinking for both eyes in 2015. Was uh, serially uh, followed up uh, with us, having almost stable reflection uh, for three years. The refractive error was a compound myopic uh, in the right eye and a mixed astigmatism for the left eye with only 618. Now this uh, gentleman was from Chennai and he used to come every three to four months from Chennai just for a checkup. And uh, you know, um, fortunately, unfortunately, he was uh, a relative of ours from my in-law side. So I had to be very careful whether to go ahead with a fakey coil for him or not. And he was very, very uh, you know, uh, positive that he wants to get the surgery done. And he waited almost one and a half to two years for the same. So this was his uh, topographic uh, reports where it showed a pretty good ACD and a pretty stable cornea. And uh, the, although the, uh, the, cent the central uh, CCT, the central cornea thickness was very low, uh, it's been stable for many years. And so I went ahead and did the uh, ICL. To my surprise, you know, the post of vision shot up from 618 to 66 parts. And I, uh, this is one of those cases where you know I was really shocked, you know, and both me and the patient were very happy. And he's been following up with me from almost same time. Now he comes every six months to one year, and the vision still maintained at that six six and six 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 parts to six nine, and is very uh, doing well. In the case two, where again a thirty four years old male had come, he was uh, he had uh, a collagen crossing done elsewhere. But he also had multiple corneal haze and scar and vascularization because he was an avid contact lens user previously, and he was there was some problems with that also. So the reflection he had a high compound myopic astigmatism in both eyes with quite low uh, vision in the left eye, but he had stable reflection for almost three two years two years. Um, these were his topographic scans and with post operatively. We did. Uh, he was 6'9 in the right eye, which was same as preoperative. The left eye came uh, beyond that and it went from 6'18 to 6'12. Uh, and he also was very happy and he's been following up every year once with us and he's doing uh, very happy. He's uh, from a local uh, area only. So, uh, points to remember, which I would say for your uh, patients to do this uh, for the fakey curls is that. Keep a vision acuity up to 618 and beyond so that you know that you're going to get the best outcome. If possible, if it's available in your place, you can try to do a specialty contact lens to see what his maximum improvement is or what he can ex you know, experience later on. Because there would be a lot of chromatic abrasions and along with this, keratoconic cornea. So that with the glasses, you might not be able to see clearly but post-operatively, he might improve a lot. So if you do a contact lens like a minuscleral or Roske, he would actually see that this is what a reference would be that you might expect or the vision that much. If there's a central haze, be careful, do not promise anything to the patient that you're gonna get beyond that or something, uh, you know, miracle to be happening, but yes, they would be better off with the glasses. Beginners to be careful, I would suggest, you know, do a few of, you know, a few tens of cases in a regular fakey chiral and then try to go for an advanced keratoconic eyes because of the anterior chamber depth and the periphery anterior chamber depth. Refraction to be repeated by oneself or a senior optometrist again and again, so that you know that the patient's refractive is stable and you're using the same kind of uh, machine and the same distance. Also inform your company while ordering the lenses that the patient or the case is about the keratoconus, FFKC or a paste post LASIK ectasia or a post LASIK also. So that they have some nomograms uh, you know, uh, to modify if they have to based on that or they would ask for some other additional information so that you have to you know, share it with them. Ideally, if you want, you can also share a topography with them. That's always better. 
but I'm not sure most of them don't ask, but some of them, in the case of criticalness, will ask that again. Subjective refraction and not a corner refraction, as it was been, uh, it was explained in the previous uh, talks, it, that makes sense. Uh, recent topo is what you should give, not the old topo. So one year patient might be somewhere else and he says, this is my topo and I want to get the uh, you know, fakey cavil now. Do not accept that. Say that you have to get the recent topo and prefer the machine which you are comfortable with. Uh, going for the plateau is criticized and the fake death, again, I'm uh, you know, uh, explaining this because this is almost always in an advanced corner, uh, critical is more than 3.4 to 3.5 and that might cause a future problem for the uh, end closure. Uh, I will thank the whole team of Kairos and, the, and uh, the team of our sessions for uh, allowing me to have this talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Priyank. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation and very uh, helpful clinical points. Thank you so much. So now I welcome uh, Dr. Rajesh Fogla for the most awaited talk on surgical management in uh, corneal uh, ectasias tips and tricks. So Dr. Uh, Rajesh, sir, before you start, any comments on the last three modalities which we have covered, the intact, topo guided and the ICL? Any practical tips for uh, clinicians, please? Hi, uh, you're able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, clear. No, it, keratoconus itself is a varied entity. So whichever modality you choose, you have to be prepared that the outcomes may not be 100%, unlike what you do in normal individuals, in normal eyes with regular astigmatism. So case selection becomes very important. Uh, you know, whether you do intax or you choose to do a toric ICL. Uh, so for me, I do intax in a very small subset of patients because it's important. There is an expense involved with the procedure when you do with the femtosecond later. And patients should understand what we define as a good outcome. What, what is a good outcome by me in terms of uh, in, improving the uh, uh, asymmetry of the cornea or, you know, reducing the higher vibration. The patient's perception of improvement may be just the improvement in the unaided vision and the reduced dependence on glasses. So I think this is very important when you check. And similarly for ICL as well, we sometimes tend to go by what we have had in one patient and we try to extrapolate the results for the subsequent patient. So the patient should understand that it is basically a transposition of whatever they are seeing with the glasses. They will have similar quality of vision after the ICL, although there is a slight improvement because of the position of the ICL inside the eye. So if you have a patient whose expectations are beyond what they are seeing with the glasses, then even ICL may not be a great option because he or she may not be happy with the quality of vision or they may still complain that they have uh, you know, difficulty at night or when they drive. So these are things that need to be taken into consideration. Otherwise, uh, for very early keratoconus or mild keratoconus, uh, definitely uh, th these are good options. Whether you do a topographic guided PRK, one caution for topographic guided PRK is, again, it's not a refractive surgery. It's basically a treatment where you try to reduce the astigmatism so that the patient can then see comfortably with glasses. And we minimize the amount of tissue that's being removed because that's something that we cannot sacrifice too much. And when you correct with cross-linking, I have had unpredictable flattening beyond what I have seen. And that happens even years later after doing. So when you're doing a combined surgery, that is something that you need to watch out for. I have had a patient who's gone into hyperopia after doing a combined uh, topo guided PRK with cross linking, and always do an accelerated protocol when you are doing that. Because when you remove the Bowman's layer, the penetration of riboflavin is quicker, and it builds up a concentration within the cornea much more. And if you don't, if you do the standard protocols, you will get the demarcation line very close to the endothelium. And in thin corneas, you may end up compromising the, uh, the endothelium as well. So these are the few points that I just wanted to add. Thank you, sir. So can we have Dr. Rajesh Fogler's talk, please? Hello, everyone. I shall be talking about surgical management of corneal ectasia. I have no financial interest to disclose. Corneal ectatic disorders comprise of keratoconus, post-refractive surgery, ectasia, pellucid marginal corneal degeneration, and keratoglobus. In the 
surgical options, you can perform penetrating keratoplasty, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, stromal augmentation, and customized corneal surgery. I shall be covering uh, the dark stromal augmentation and the customized uh, corneal surgery in this presentation. Uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty replaces 90% of the corneal stroma with donor tissue and has the advantage of preserving the host endothelium. There are two basic techniques, the common quick bubble uh, technique, which utilizes stromal air injection and the manual dissection, which is near decimates. These are the various steps of big bubble jalk. Uh, a sequential air injection is uh, useful to achieve the desired size of the big bubble and avoid a spontaneous rupture. So you initiate the big bubble and then you do a paracentesis to release aqueous and lower the intraocular pressure, following which the bubble can be expanded to the desired size. The same bubble can also be created by injecting viscoelastic into the stroma. So in this case, you will see that cohesive viscoelastic is injected into the deep stroma, resulting in formation of a type one bubble, which instead of air is filled with viscoelastic. This is the post-operative outcome of DAL, which is pretty good and retains the healthy host endothelium. This is the same uh, DALC surgery performed using femtosecond laser to make the initial cut. So the shaped incision like a mushroom or a zigzag uh, allows better graft or junction apposition and induces lower amount of hystic matter. That's the post-operative corneal topography showing a fairly regular corneal surface. If you have scars involving the decimates membrane, then the big bubble DALC may not be advisable. In such situation, we go ahead and we do a manual DALC, where after the trephination, the cornea is debulked, about uh, 40 to 50% of the corneal stroma is removed, after which we make a peripheral pocket, and then a stromal pocket forceps is used to create a track along the trephination margin, and this is carried along for more than 180 degrees, both clockwise and anticlockwise. After which you can use something like the Malbrand's peeling technique, where your left hand is trying to peel the stroma and the right hand of a stromal dissector, that's basically breaking the stromal fibers. And there, thereafter you put a donor tissue in position. So this is the same case you can see post-operatively has a fairly clear cornea with minimal residual stromal bed. And on OCT, you see that the thickness is only about 30 microns. So this is a flow chart uh, on decision making, whether you do a big bubble dull or a manual dull. Uh, this is a stromal augmentation technique that we started performing back in 2014-15. And here we are using the femtosecond laser to create a nine millimeter stromal pocket at 200 microns depth, after which we implant a 100 micron stromal lenticule, which includes the Bowman layer. Uh, in the initial cases, we also cross-link the lenticule prior to implantation with the objective of reducing the stromal keratocytes so that the risk of stromal rejection can be minimized and also to try and strengthen the stromal collagen so that patient uh, the keratoconus progression can be halted so this is the same patient in the post of early post-operative experience and if we look at uh, this patient uh, who 19 year old female with keratoconus unable to tolerate contact lenses best character vision was about 618 and you can see post uh, stromal augmentation, this is five year follow up, still maintains 6 6 vision. And if you look at the difference map, you can see that there's almost six to seven diopters of central flattening, and the central cornea has become more regular. That's the appearance five years after stromal augmentation, looks pretty clear cornea. This is again the difference map showing you before and after the lenticule. You can see the inferior cone has now become more centrally placed and that's the difference map showing you the central flattening the change in the higher order and the coma pre and post lenticule and that's the obviously the thickness from 416 has increased to five or above 500 post lenticule implantation very advanced keratoconus like this like a keratoglobus uh, you can go ahead and do a large diameter dark so here we do first a conjunctival peritomy preserving the limbal stem cell and in the center, there was some tissue. So we made a six millimeter partial trephination, make a peripheral groove, and then we dissected center to periphery. And that's the donor tissue prepared with one to two millimeters of scleral rim. 
After this is completed, the donor is secured in position and after which we close the conjunctiva on top. That's the post-operative appearance. And you can see this patient has completed four years of follow-up with fairly good outcome. That's the pre and post-op in shine plug images. You can see very thin cornea pre-op and post-op it's much better. A similar case wherein uh, we had a patient with uh, a huge ectasia. So here we did a large diameter dulk and combined it with a central endothelial keratoplasty as well. And this is the post-operative appearance. You can see that the cornea looks pretty clear with a normal curvature and doing very well. This is a, recently we saw a patient who has had a radial keratotomy earlier followed by a cataract surgery now has thinning and ectasia with a lot of scarring. So we did the same uh, uh, large diameter dial combined with the central endothelial keratoplasty and this patient is also doing very well. So basically in conclusion, the surgical options vary with the disease severity and the extent of corneal involvement. DALC should be considered whenever the endothelium is healthy. Uh, for the big bubble DALC, surgical techniques still are evolving to ensure greater success rate. The pre-op evaluation and surgical planning is essential to minimize complication. Femtosecond laser technology with integrated OCT may definitely help improve outcomes in future. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fogla. So it's always such a treat to see your videos. We can go all day seeing your videos. <laughs> so thank you so much. But the last two cases, can you just brief us something that was very interesting? Uh, you did an anterior and uh, uh, endothelial keratoplasty. So what was the indications for that? And uh, just briefly about the surgery, sir. Uh, the cases which have uh, very surface or a huge ectasia for which you need to do a dalk or an epikeratoplasty. But then you can always go back and later on do a central penetrating keratoplasty, but that would mean two surgical interventions. And if you do a large diameter PKP, obviously the injection will be very So we monitor by doing a, a large diameter dalk, that means you do the initial dissection starting near the limbus, uh, do a debulking of the cornea. And then you do a central 5.5 or 6 millimeter trephination and remove the central cornea because the endothelium is not functioning. And then replace with a desec lenticule, which is also fashioned in the same 5.5, 6 millimeter. You place that and then you put your large diameter uh, dial graft that you have where you have removed the decimates. So, and then after putting the initial four sutures, you can put an air bubble in the anterior chamber and then reposition the disc, whichever way you want to center it. So it achieves the purpose, like the dial graph gives the shape to the cornea by normalizing it. And the central lenticule gives you the endothelial function, which maintains the clear cornea. And because the endothelial graft is only in the center five to six millimeter, the risk of rejection is pretty less. So that way you have, you achieve the advantages of both the DALC and the DSEC rather than doing a large, but, but a sequential procedure can also be done where you do an initial procedure to build up the corneal thickness, normalize the curvature, and then go back and plan for a PKP uh, later on. Beautiful. Excellent, sir. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I think we are uh, uh, exactly done with our time. So I thank all our excellent speakers. Special thanks to Dr. Rajesh Fogla for joining us uh, through his busy schedule. And uh, thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dipti. Thank you. Thank you, Priyank, Dr. Rupashi, Dr. Raghu, Dr. Nandini. Thank you, Dipti. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.